Just a few scriptures before we pray. <clears throat> Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 18, something very difficult to do. He says, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So even when things don't go the way you would like for them to go, you have to praise him for that. Because he also says in Psalms 50, verse 15, he says, Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will honor me. And because most of us have some requests that we're praying for continually, Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, that we all should come, all those who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give us rest. He has a plan for each one of our lives, and we should not pray for him to take the hard times away. We should pray to him that he should teach us what he wants us to teach through the hard times. Otherwise, the hard times meant absolutely nothing. So the wilderness times, if we look at the life of Moses, like we learned this morning in Sabbath school, we look at the life of Moses. He was trained in Pharaoh's palace for 40 years, and then God had to unteach him what he learned there so that he could be in his service for the next 80. And it was in his wilderness experience that Moses became someone that was a representative of Christ. Numbers tells us that he was the most humble man on the face of the earth, even willing to give up his own salvation to save the rebellious group of people he was leading. So don't forget to praise God for the things that he is doing for us, even though when it doesn't look like it's what we asked for, we should still praise him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it's our privilege this morning as your children, your adopted children by the blood of Jesus, that we can come before your throne of grace boldly with our thanksgivings, our praises, and our requests. Lord, first, first off this morning, we want to thank you for what Jesus has done for us. Let us never forget that the sins that we commit cost the life of your son to pay to redeem us from the consequences of those. Lord, help us in our response to what you've already done for us, that we will follow those commands, the ones that you lived out perfectly in your own life on our behalf, because we're not only saved by your death, but also by your life. Lord, we ask this morning that you will let your spirit to come into our lives, that we can be reflections of you to the world around us. We know the last thing the world has to see is a duplication of your character in the lives of your children. You want us to be the Jesus that people will meet at work and at home and wherever we go. Thank you that you can give us the power to be that person. Lord, help us to make that full surrender this morning. We pray especially for pastor as you open your word this morning, that words of life will come from his lips, touch our hearts, that we can leave here people that reflect you better than before. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, but I don't tell you near enough how much I appreciate you. Each one of you, I, th I am so blessed, Cindy and I are so blessed, we got the best church family in the whole wide world. And, and, I, and I miss you, I've been gone a couple weeks and it feels like I've been gone forever, you know, uh, but it's so good to be back, it's so good to see each one of you here, and you come out on a rainy day. I mean, think about that. You could have stayed home. I know it's a lot of temptation to, to sleep in. It would have been for anybody, but you made a choice to be here, and I want to thank you for it. Uh, and, and I've got to say this. 
I've been, I don't know how many churches that Cindy and I have had an opportunity to be a part of now, but this is the very first church that has ever asked me to be part of the choir. <laughs> Nobody's ever done that before. I, I even learned how to, to make notes last night, didn't I, Terry? I did. Yeah, I noticed that we were singing. We were singing and doing really good, and all of a sudden, all the guys quit singing, and the girls were singing, out, and I kind of kind of messed up there at first, but I backed off. So I made some notes. St stop right here. <laughs> and I read them. So I praise God for that. And, uh, you know, I'm so excited because, you know, we've got so much potential. This church has got so much potential. Uh, when we move into this new church over here, we're going to be the, 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 a pillar of light on a, on a hill. A light of love. This church is full of love, full of compassion. And, and I can't, see, can't wait to see what God is going to do. I know you're excited about it too. June the 2nd, right? That, uh, no, the second Sabbath. It's the second Sabbath. The second Sabbath of June. We've got to get that right. We're going to be at camp meeting. I'd be the only one there. Uh, but uh, anyway, the second the second. The second Sabbath in June, we're going to start up. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started here. Father in heaven, you're a good God, and we're so excited about what you're doing in our life individually, but also what you're doing corporately in our church body here, that we get to reflect you to this community. We know we can't do that without you, Lord, and we know that, that, that we can trust that what you have begun in our life, you're going to continue doing. So keep on doing what you're doing, Lord. Pour out your spirit and fill us with your love and your joy and your peace. We want to be contagious to everyone around us. We want to be contagious for you. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Talking about contagious. I got a letter this morning from my wife. Um, we email each other in the same house. Y'all ever do that? Text each other? You, you know you're getting bad when you do that, right? Um, but I got this letter. It says, I got a letter recently, and it was unexpected. The writer didn't share a concern, ask for advice, or want anything. It was just a letter filled with kind words. Wow. Talk about gold for my soul. The letter reminded me of God's pro proverb that kind words are like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. You can, br you can brighten someone's day if you give them an apple of gold. Ask God to impress you with someone who might need their day brightened with a humorous or complimentary card or maybe just a phone call. Rudyard Kipling said, words uh, are, of course, the most powerful drug used by mankind. It's the, it, if that's true, think how meaningful it might be to someone to receive a simple kind thought from you. That was a really timely letter here because that's exactly what God had put on my heart to talk about today. Open up your Bibles. If you've got your Bibles or your smartphones or they can put it up on the screen here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Uh, and, and then, um, therefore, this needs words right here. Therefore, what does God tells us to do here? encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. I love that. Don't you? Don't you love that thought? You know, I, I Googled that. I Googled the word encourage, encourage. And just to kind of see, you know, I know what I kind of thought encourage meant, but let's see what uh, uh, this is. It says, come along beside, encourage, come along beside, give support right? Give hope. I like the word hope. Encourage is kind of to give hope to someone. Help is, is another word that, that was used. To develop. Do you like these words for encourage here? It, it's, it, think about this. Encourage. It's like putting courage into someone. Joyce got that. Yeah. It's like putting courage into someone. Our, it, it, when, when you do this, what we're doing, the Bible says, is we're building them up, right? We're building them up, helping them out. In our relationships, in our relationships, we need to be more intentional about this, okay? I promise you, you're not very good at it 
as good as you could be at it, right? We could all be a little bit better at this. And when we are, we bring a little sunshine into people's life. We build them up and we encourage them. When we choose our words wisely, right? When we choose our words wisely, when we speak words that will encourage, that will build up each other. So now, just like, just like that you, our words can build some, someone up, our words can also do what? We can tear people down. We can do that. We can tear people down. Words can be very hurtful. And it's hard to unhear them after they've been spoken. Now, we all know that to be true, don't we? Sometimes we just say something and it just, it just comes out so quick. You're at home, your wife, and you're talking about something. And, and before you know it, you've said something. You know that you wished you hadn't said. And you wished you could reel those words back in. But they won't come back in. Now, uh, Cindy, I've heard Cindy before use this illustration, toothpaste. You know, so that people can understand. Now, toothpaste, it's easy to kind of get it to come out, but it's pretty hard to get that toothpaste to come back in, isn't it? It's pretty hard to do that. It's the same way when we speak these unkind or hurtful words. We really need to be real careful about that when we do that. Uh, it, so just like encouragement is, is puts courage into someone, discourage has that opposite, opposite effect uh, on, on people. It tears them down. Uh, uh, I looked up that word, and it says, it, it, it says it's to cause someone to lose confidence. Or I'm going to use my own slang here. It knocks the wind out of people. That's what it does when you, when you say discouraging words. Now, one of the most fundamental advice, the fundamental teachings that a marriage counselor will give a couple... Uh, uh, that when they're, when they're having difficulties and they come to the counselor, is he, he would tell them, both of them, to go home and for 30 days, for 30 days every day, look for something that you can compliment your spouse on. 30 days. Really make an effort to this. Look for something that you can compliment your spouse on. And for those that do it, for those that do this, they come back different people. They're like newlyweds. Why? Because they started following the principles in the Bible. They started looking for ways that they can be encouraging each other. That they can say things that will build each other up. Right, Stacy? Are you taking notes here? Okay. That they, 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 can, that they can do that. All right. Now, the Bible, the Bible is full of... Full of, of, of things to say about this. And I'm going to read several scriptures here. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 says, Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those that listen. Now, God thought this was important enough that he put it in this word very clearly here, didn't he? Right? Here's another in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 9. With their mouths, the godless destroy their neighbors. How, how do they destroy their, their neighbors? With their mouths, right? With their mouths. But through knowledge, the righteous escape. Now, I want you to listen to this other translation here, the Good News translation. Uh, it says, you can be ruined. This is Proverbs eleven nine again. You can be ruined by the talk of godless people. Think about that. Think about what the Bible is saying here. You can be ruined by the talk of godless people, but the wisdom of the righteous can, can save many. Now, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1. And we, we all know this, right? This, this, this should be 101 here for us. A gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Is that right? Can anybody relate to that? Yeah. And then verse 4. Kind words bring life, but cruel words crush the spirit. I think we all need, I think we all need this. Every one of us. You know, this is so important. The psalmist says this is so important that in Psalms 141, in verse 3, he says, because this is so important, church, he says, set a guard over my mouth. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Friends, I don't want to intentionally hurt anyone. I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. And I know that you don't either, right? We don't want to be. You know, we've all heard this saying. And this was the title 
of the message today, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Haven't we heard that? I mean, haven't we heard that since Cradle Row, right? What do you think? You know, um, what, what verse is that in the Bible? <laughs> what verse is that in the Bible? I mean, I looked it up. I, I searched my search engine on my Bible search engine, and I was, look, I was just sure it was there. And I, I looked in, in, um, in my Bible search engine. You know what it said? It says, we're sorry there is no Bible results for this search. Friends, it's simply not in the Bible. It's not in there. You're not going to find it in it. It's not going to be there. Who ever taught this? Who ever taught this? Who ever got it started? Uh, had never been made fun of, fun of on the playground. Whoever, whoever said this had never been called fatso in front of all the classmates and they all laughed. You know, whoever, whoever thought of this had never been called stupid in front of other people. Had never, had never been looked down on and said, you, you would never amount to anything. Whoever said this had never been made fun of as the ugliest kid in the class by the young girl that you thought you were in love with. You see, it hurts the most. It cuts deeper when it's heard or, or given by someone that you really care about. And sometimes it has effects that will last forever. We've got to be so careful, parents, at the words we choose to use to our children. Because whether we realize it or not, it's sinking in. Because they are hearing this from the people that matter most to them. Husbands, we've got to be so careful at the words we use to our wife. Wives, we've got to be so careful at the words that we use to our husbands because we are the most important people in their life. And believe it or not, it can have a lifetime effect on the person that you're talking to. And, and in fact, the Bible, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, the tongue has the power of of life and death. Think about this. The tongue has the power of life and death. Did you know, did you know that when you condemn someone, that when you criticize someone, that, that when you speak negative words to someone, whether you realize it or not, you're really on the enemy's side? You know why I know that? Because the Bible says in John 10.10 10, that, that it is the devil's goal to kill, steal, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. So if, you are, so if you are one who steals hope, if you are one that, that kills dreams, if you are one that destroys self-esteem, whether you realize it or not, you are working on the enemy's team. We need to guard our words. We need to be very careful about our words. We, we, need, we, need, we, need, to put, we need to put a guard. Ask God. And this is something I want you to know. I'm confessing that I have to talk to God a lot about. Because it just was so natural for me to spout out something negative. And, and not, sometimes joking. But friends, I want to tell you what. If you've got to say you're joking when you get through. I have to pray about this. Lord set a guard. I don't want to say anything in response to anything that somebody has done to me. In some type form of retaliation. It does no good whatsoever. Pray for me about that. I don't want to hurt anybody with my words. And I know that you don't either. 
And, and they can happen so quick. Now, on the other hand, when we intentionally, and that's the word I want you to take home, I want you to be intentional about the words that you use. If, when we choose to be intentional and we use words intentionally that will build people up, that will encourage people, we are on God's team, right? We are letting our little light shine for Jesus when we do that is what, is what we're doing here. Now, I want, you to, I want you to listen to this right here because this, this, is, this is true. Here's the truth. What we need, we need to speak words of truth, right? We need to speak words of truth. And here it is, John 3, 16 and 17. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Did you hear that? Did you catch these really important words here? Jesus did not come here to beat you up. If anybody ever had a right to beat somebody up, Jesus had a right to beat us up for our life. But he realized it, that it's the love of God that draws us. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. The Bible says so. He didn't come here to beat us up and tear us down. He came here to lift us up and pick us up and save us. Amen? To lift us up out of the gutter where every single one of us are at. We're just there, folks. Whether we realize it or not. So, if you don't, if you don't tell your children, if you don't tell your wife, your husband, if you don't tell them the truth, who will? Are you going to depend on the world out there to tell your family the truth right now? Don't do it. They need to hear the truth. If you don't tell them that God loves them, who will? If you don't tell them that, that he loves them just the way they are. That's right. That he loves them just the way they are. Who's going to tell them? If you, if you don't tell them that, it, that, it, that it's okay, I forgive you. I forgive you because Jesus forgives me. I did worse. Instead of just doing like we normally do. If you, if you don't tell them it's okay to fall. Because you know what? Every one of us have failed. Every single one of us. But the ones that make it are going to be the ones when they fall, they get back up. We've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. The Bible says so. So we need to have a little mercy. And we need to have a little grace toward others. That's the good news. That's the good news. I made a mess of my, out of my life, but God can take my mess and make a message out of it. He can take my scars, and He can turn them into stars. He can do that for His glory. God can do that. That's the good news. Who's going to tell them that nobody's perfect? Nobody's perfect. Just learn from your mistakes. If you don't tell your wife, your children, your family that, who's going to tell them? Yeah, who's going to tell them that everybody is a somebody? You know that? Everybody's a somebody. Everybody is. Created by God. For God. Created in His image. Oh, you're, you're, you're not ugly. You're created in the image of God. He created you just the way you are. For a special place in his heart that can only be filled by you. There's not another you on this earth right here. God loves you. Who's going to tell our children? Who's going to tell our wife and our family that are already beat up and discouraged because the enemy's telling them, oh, you're ugly. You don't, you're a misfit. You're, 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 you're a loser. Friends, we've got to tell the truth to our family. We've got to build them up. Be part of God's team. If you don't tell them this truth, who will? We're told to spur one another on. Now, how many, how many uh, cowgirls we got here in Springtown? 
This used to be the cowboy church. I mean, when I'm talking to people all the time, they call it the cowboy church. Now, how many cowgirls we... Who, knew, who knows what a spur is, Stacy? You probably don't use one on Frederick, though, do you? <laughs> but but the giddy up. You know, it, it's, it's, it's an, a form of encouragement. It's a motivation. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds. Friends, I want, I want to challenge you here. If you start doing this, now this could be a game changer for the rest of your life. If I got everybody's attention, because this is good. If you start doing this, if you start being an encourager, it will make a huge impact on someone's life. But do you know the person that will be affected most by it? You. It will affect you more. Mr. Encourager. Miss Encourager. It will. People will run to you. People will want to be around you all the time. They will. And there's nothing wrong with that. I want you to. Anytime Jesus walked into town, he had crowds all around him, right? He did. They flocked to Jesus. When Jesus is in the house, the house packs out. You know why? Because everybody is starving for this. We live in a world right now that just beats each other up and tears them down. I don't even like turning the TV on. It's so negative, negative, negative. Friends, God needs encouragers. He needs people to hold their light, to let their light shine. We've got hope. We, God needs people that will give hope. They would share good news. You would be like a, a, a cool drink of water on a hot, hot day. I challenge you. People need this. You know, have you noticed? Has anybody noticed how COVID has made people angry? And very opinionated in a negative way toward anybody that don't agree with them? Friends, I, I, as we get closer and closer to Jesus' return, there seems to be a further divide between those that act like Jesus and those that don't act like Jesus. Right? I want to encourage you to be an encourager and, and look on the bright side and point everyone to Jesus. You know, it's easy to get negative. You know what? It's easy. You can fall in that trap. It's a slippery slope. I mean, you can get negative really, really easy. You know, I'm, I'm told all the time by well-meaning people, you, you need to tell it like it is, Pastor. You, you, you need to call a sin a sin. Uh, you, you, you need to lay down the law on these people. They need it. What are you laughing about, Stacy? I'm going to tell on you. <laughs> it wasn't Stacy. <laughs> It wasn't nobody <laughs> to hear. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me say something. I don't want to tell it like it is. I want to tell it like how it could be. I, instead of pointing out their sins, I want to point them to Jesus. I don't want to beat somebody up, tell them how bad they are. They already know that. The enemy reminds them. Anytime they look in the mirror, the enemy is reminding them of this. I want to. I want to tell them. I want to tell them about Jesus. Is what I want to do. I want to. I want to point them. Instead of pointing out their problem, I want to point them to the problem solver. Right. That's what I want to do. If you really want to wake somebody up. If you really want to straighten somebody out, point them to Jesus. Jesus said so. He said so. He said, point them to my death. Uh, Stacy, today when you were doing the Sabbath school lesson, and you know how you started Exodus 20 with, with reminding people he's the one that brought them out of, out of Israel, and then, and, then, and then you went to the cross and said, I'm the one that saved you. There... It, that just boom in my mind right there. When we point people to Jesus, the one that got on the cross, the one that died for us, Paul says that's where the dynamite's at. That's where the power of the gospel is at. There's something powerful about seeing that Jesus loved me, sinful me, that he loved me enough to go through what he went through for me, that he cares that much for me. That's what breaks our heart. 
That's what touches our life. In John 12, 32, Jesus says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He's signifying what kind of death he was going to die. That's right. There's something powerful. In it. So what's going to draw people? What's going to draw people out of, out, of, out of Laodicea? Point them to Jesus. What's going to draw people out of Babylon? Point them to Jesus. Draw them. Draw them. It's the love of God. It's the love of God that draws. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Give them the real Jesus. The whole Jesus, not just part of the Jesus. You know, not, ju not just the New Testament, not just Daniel and Revelation, but the whole Bible. Right? All Jesus. Give them the real Jesus. The world is starving for the real Jesus right now. They are starving for Him, and they will be drawn to Him. So our, our kind of a takeaway thought here, our words can be stones that hurt, are gifts that build up. Once they're out of our mouth, they can't be taken back. Take that home with you. Now, we've all probably seen or heard the acronym THINK, right? Has anybody seen that? THINK. How's it spelled? T-H-I-N-K, right? Did I get that right, Cindy? Okay. She won't let me on her Facebook page because I misspell words every once in a while. And it, and it, she makes me put... She, uh, Ricky on Cindy's Facebook page. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, you, was that negative sounding? I hope not. Because uh, it wasn't, honey. It was negative on me. I'll take that. So, anyway, before, before, so here's what I want you to think about. Before you speak, uh, and this would help you so much. Guys, this is going to help you so much in your marriage. Before you speak, think. Think. T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, K, is it kind? Right? So we got that? Think. Think. True, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. All right. So I'm getting ready to wrap this up. I've talked to you a lot about the importance of being an encourager to someone. To be an encourager. But it's possible there might be a few out there that might be thinking, Pastor, <laughs> Pastor, I need encouraging. I need encouraging. Friends, is your tank empty? Is there some... Is there somebody out there this tank's empty right now? Let Jesus fill you up. This Bible is full of encouragement. These words here are words of life is what they are. Fill up with Jesus. There's a lot of talk right now that there's some type of fuel shortage. Have you heard about that? People in lines and everything like that. I was down in South Arkansas and, I, and visiting my dad, and I was so afraid. Wow, we might not be able to get back. I was hearing about it on the news. Fortunately, it was more on, a, on a, the south and the eastern side. But, uh, there, but I want you to know, there's no shortage of Jesus. You can have all Jesus you want. All of him you want. Uh, there's a never-ending supply of hope and encouragement found in these words right here. You know, I, I, love, I love the Psalms. I just love the Psalms. Are you running on empty right now? I want to encourage you to go home and spend some time in the Psalms. The Psalms, they, they, just, they just pick you up. Uh, uh, most of the Bible, most of the Bible speaks, you know, speaks to my heart. The Psalms speaks for me. When I don't have the words, when, 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 when I'm just on empty, and I, and I can't even muster up the words, it's like the psalmist speaks for me. It's just so wonderful. I want to encourage you to do that. And, and, and sometimes I feel like nobody cares. Nobody cares. Go to the Johns. John, the little Johns. Love, love, love. Love, love. All throughout that. And then, and then the prophecies in the Bible. The prophecies in the Bible give us so much hope. 
They, 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 give, they give us confidence. The prophecies give us confidence that you can trust the word of, of God. Because all these prophecies have been fulfilled just like the Bible said they were going to be fulfilled. The only one we're waiting on is Jesus Christ's soon return. So go to the scriptures here. They give you so much hope. Let me share a scripture. Romans chapter five, uh, 15 and verse 4 and 5. Listen to these words right here. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. A seminary professor and his wife were in vacation, on vacation in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. A beautiful area. Cindy and I have been there. They were at a local restaurant and they were uh, preparing to have a meal. And this, this very distinguished older gentleman walked in the door and he started mingling around the crowd. And as though, you could tell everybody just seemed like they knew this guy. I mean, he just, he just had that way about him. It wasn't long he mingled his way over to where they were at. And after a little bit of small talk, finding out that, that, uh, that this was a seminary professor, uh, the guy says, hmm, so you teach pastors. He said, boy, have I got a story for you. And he pulls up his chair and sits down beside him. Hey, he points, points out the window. He says, see those mountains over there? He says, at the base of those mountains, there's, there's, a little bitty, there's a little town there. And in that town, many years ago, there was a, there was a unwed mother that gave birth to a, to a young child. And, and, uh, and he says, this young child grew up not ever knowing who his father was. And he said that, uh, he said, he, he, and for all this young boy's life, it, it just, it, the, you know, growing up in a small town with, with, uh, with uh, you know, being an illegitimate child was not an easy thing to get through. It was pretty hard. And every time that somebody would ask him, who's your daddy? It would just totally embarrass the young man and he would just stick his head down. When that, when that young man was about 11 years old, a new preacher came to town. And the new preacher, uh, when he, on his first sermon, after he got through, he sat out front and greeted everybody on their way out. It wasn't long before the single mom walked out with her son, and uh, they greeted each other, passed names back and forth. And then the preacher looked down at the young man. And he said, well, son, <clears throat> he says, and he asked the dreaded question, who's your daddy? Well, maybe it was the, Maybe it was a paralyzed look in the young boy's eyes. Maybe, 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 it was, maybe it was a silence, the total silence in the crowd. Or more than likely, it was a quick prompting of the Holy Spirit. The preacher immediately bit down. And he looked, looked at the young boy in the eye with a little smile. He says, oh, nobody's got to tell me who you are. I recognize the family resemblance. You are a child of God. You have an inheritance, young man, and don't ever forget that. With that, the, the older gentleman stood up, and he says, You know, if that preacher hadn't told me those words, I probably would have never mounted to anything. He walked on off, and about that time, the waitress came up to where he was where at the table, and they were still just awestruck. And they said, Who was that man right there? And the waitress says, oh, you don't know who that is? Everybody knows that. That's, that's, that's Governor Ben Hooper, the former governor of Tennessee. Friends, our words can make a huge difference in someone's life. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can hurt forever. Your words can bring life or death into someone's life. Father in heaven, Thank you, dear God, for these simple instructions, how we can let our light shine and how we can be part of your team, how we can be an encourager, how we can make a difference in someone's life that could have 
an eternal effect. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, uh, I think this is a special day. One thing I want to brag on, we've got the best cooks here in Springtown in the whole world, don't we? And we're going to get to eat some of this good food. So I hope that each one of you can stick around. If y'all would like, would you want me to... Are we going to have a closing song? Okay. Why don't we go ahead and have, and ble have a blessing on our food? And uh, that way everybody can go ahead and get started. Join me, please. Father in heaven, thank you for our spiritual food. We needed it, Lord. Now we ask that you would bless this uh, physical food and let it be used to nourish and strengthen our body so that we can get the good news out there how much you love us, how much you care about us, and how good you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.